Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine, and I'm here with Robin John. Hey, guys. Hello. All right. And this week is my story. Um, I picked a story called Black Eyed Woman by Viet Fan Nguyen is how I believe you pronounce it. And I found this because I was looking up ghost stories. Um, I was looking these up like around Halloween, so... I was like, ooh, let's do something spooky. And this is like a literal ghost story. So I'm going to read a section where the ghost appears. When knocking woke me, it was dark outside. My watch said 6.35 in the evening. The knock came again, gentle, tentative. Despite myself, I knew who it was. I had locked the bedroom door just in case, and now I pulled the covers over my head, my heart beating fast. I willed him to go away, but when he started rattling the doorknob, I knew I had no choice but to rise. The fine hairs of my body stood at attention with me as I watched the doorknob tremble with the pressure of his grip. I reminded myself that he had given up his life for me. The least I could do was open the door. He was bloated and pale, hair feathery, skin dark, clad in black shorts and a ragged gray t-shirt, arms and legs bony. The last time I had seen him, he was taller by a ahead. Now our situations were reversed. When he said my name, his voice was hoarse and raspy, not at all like his adolescent alto. His eyes, though, were the same, curious as were his lips, slightly parted, always prepared to speak. A purple bruise with undertones of black gleamed on his left temple, but the blood I remembered was gone, washed away, I suppose, by salt water and storms. Even though it was not raining, he was water-soaked. I could smell the sea on him, and worse, I could smell the boat, rancid with human sweat and excreta. When he said my name, I trembled, but this was a ghost of someone whom I loved and would never harm, the kind of ghost who my mother had said would not harm me. Come in, I said, which seemed to be the bravest thing I could say. Unmoved, he looked at the carpet on which he was dripping water. When I brought him a clean t-shirt and shorts along with a towel, he looked at me expectantly until I turned around and let him change. The clothes were my smallest, but still a size too large for him, the shorts extending to his knees, the t-shirt voluminous. I motioned him in, and this time he obeyed, sitting on my rumpled bed. He refused to meet my gaze, seeming more few fearful of me than I was of him. While he was still 15, I was 38, no longer an exuberant tomboy, reluctant to talk unless I had a purpose, as was the case when I interviewed Victor. Being an author, even one of the third or fourth rank, involved in an etiquette I could live up to. But what does one say to a ghost except to ask why he was here? I was afraid of the answer, so instead I said, what took you so long? When I read this, I didn't know what I was reading. Like I said, I just kind of looked for ghost stories. And then what I ended up really liking about this was how much time they spent with the ghost. I feel like in a horror movie, and I don't really read a whole lot of horror fiction, but especially in movies, the ghosts are usually these flashes of things that you see and it's the anticipation of when they'll appear on screen that's like most terrifying and here I felt that the author still achieved this eerie sense that she suspended well it's a male author but it's from a a woman's perspective this this piece that anticipation is maintained throughout and we see the ghost multiple occasions and we're still not completely okay with his presence it's still eerie and obviously it's all tinged with this really sad backstory of of how and why he died. And I felt more kind of hollow after reading this than I do when I read like or see scary movies. This did so much more for me than couldn't even tell you the last horror movie I saw in theaters. But usually you leave a horror movie and you're like, oh, oh, oh." but that's it. They were all, uh, what do you call them? They're not, it's not slapstick, but there's a word for like those kinds of moments in horror movies. that Jump scares. Yeah, jump scares. There was no jump scares in this story. Yeah, this story was not a jump scare story. He knocked on the door. (laughs) Right. And And even that, it was after the mom told her, listen, he was here. And she's like, what? So she already knew who it was going to be. Yeah, oh. she knew what was coming. And still the, the knock was, I, I guess in horror movies, that's also the case, right? Well, that's what, you know, build up anticipation. That's it's, what, and, and all the music, yeah. there's always the music that's telling you what to feel. And in this, I just felt like the author achieved all of those things in this very quiet story. Yeah, it was interesting to see a ghost story that's about sadness. Yeah. As opposed to what you're describing with like a Western ghost story. So Western ghost stories seem like they're about, fe- they're about fear and they're about terror. Whereas this one, even though the mom describes there's kind of good ghosts, bad ghosts, good deaths, bad deaths. There, The ghosts here, like there's never really a sense of, there's never an ounce of fear really. And all the har- the horror and terror is attached to reality, which makes me wonder if the kind of a Western st- a storytelling with ghosts, is there sort of an unwillingness to deal directly with whatever horror is by kind of having the ghost as the horror item or as like the, um, the manifestation of the terror. Whereas this is just, the ghost is just, it's more of like a vehicle for sadness and just kind of human loss which was totally different it's like um i don't know if it's more grown up 
or if it's mm. there's more it shows more of a willingness to deal with whatever the cause of the fear is or not not necessarily feel here fear here but just whatever the horror part is so it seems like they're just they're coming they're approaching these negative feelings just at a totally different angle i've read a couple of um short stories it was about it was by a, a, uh, an american guy but he was telling stories from other cultures and they also had this kind of same like kind of slow sadness to them um which is just really interesting to think about and it's kind of refreshing and it's just it makes you think about ghosts in a different way not something to be feared but something to be um sympathized with yeah what took you so long in getting here was the last line you you read yeah right and um the mother talks about oh, he had to swim this whole way it just gives the the ghost this kind of i don't know the sad i guess cast to his afterlife right he's been working all this time to find the people who need to be yeah, found he's been on this lonely journey and he shows up and he's literally bloated and the way she's describing him physically is all something that happened to him after the fact yeah she's saying that he's waterlogged and that had nothing to do with how he died that day i'm wondering if i should explain a little bit of the backstory just that this is a story about a daughter that lives with her her older mother and the daughter has kind of disappointed the family and that she never got married or had kids she's a ghostwriter which is a funny pun throughout there is a little bit of humor that way when she talks about her actual job of not getting credit for these stories victor who is mentioned in that bit that i read is a guy a current client of hers who at one point talks about how he also sees the ghosts of his family members who died in a plane crash and part of her job is to write about that part of his life and then all of this is told over the course of like a couple nights it seems like where the mom says your brother visited and then we find out that the brother's been dead for something like 15 years he died in this like pirate ship attack where one of his last acts was to disguise his sister as a as a boy so that she wouldn't be taken and she's not taken but they find out and they rape her and they kill him and so what rob's talking about that sadness is has everything to do with the fact that this brother died that way and that the daughter was also raped but the family like never discusses it so she uses a lot lot of metaphors that way to describe the ghost of that situation for her and how she feels like a a walking ghost right she's never recovered from this she doesn't go on to have family her mom doesn't even discuss it with her it's just this like burden that she's carrying so there's this whole cast of the story like you guys said but it still gave me chills right it wasn't just sad it was also there's something eerie about it too so that's the whole backstory but she does so much with this this weird description of how this ghost, like you said, has had this journey. And the way that the mom says, oh, he's here. People who believe in ghosts almost freak me out more than ghosts. <laughs> That's right. When they're like, oh, no, this is legit. Let me tell you about a couple things that have happened to me. I, I eat that stuff up. I like the way that um, like a ghost is a, is a great metaphor for an unfinished past, right? And then this ghost appears and kind of confronts her with the past that she's trying to or trying to leave behind. Or, or has left behind without thinking about it, kind of let fade into the background. And now she, the ghost is there, and um, the only thing she can think about when he's there is that past, and he kind of forces her to, to confront it. And I think that's, you know, that's a thing that ghosts kind of let you do in a story is um, bring up the past. It could be a literal ghost, in, as in this case, or, or memory ghosts, or different kinds of things. But yeah, so, you know, in that way, the ghost is kind of a vehicle for her story. But, um, but yeah, I like the way that the ghost is used as a device. Vice. Right. Well, like you said, though, that's like a commonly held ghost trope, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. That they, they can't leave because they have unfinished business. And the unfinished business is always the living's unfinished business. It's yeah. not the ghost's unfinished business. Well, yeah, the ghost has to go tell the living person something or other that really ends up helping the living person. That's fine. So that didn't that was familiar. But what was different here, I felt like, was how this family, particularly the mother, has grown up with these like cultural beliefs that say that this is commonplace. She explains it a couple times to her daughter, not all ghosts act the same way. You know, a baby ghost isn't going to act like a a grandfather ghost. Like, don't you know that? And this is why it took that long. And you have to set out clothes for the ghosts, you know, like in that scene already changes. I mean, the story is about the daughter and the mother coming together after years of not confronting their past. And now she's like, you know what? I'm going to write your story instead of these other people's stories. Yeah, that's how it ends. I thought that was nice. There's, There's a cute moment where the mom says something like, who wants to hear my story? But the daughter can tell she's pleased as she like starts taking these notes why write down what i'm telling you 
Well, someone has to. Writers. At least you won't be m- just making things up like you usually do. Rude. I like that. <laughs> what did you guys think of the um, having the Vietnam War play kind of the such a central role there as far as separating the family and that I'm, I'm assuming that the pirate attack happened during the war because they're still kids and now she's in America and they're, yeah. they're displaced and you have these beliefs that are so antithetical to how we think of ghosts and it's so matter of fact to them and it's kind of a way of keeping the culture alive I too which is kind of a fun pun a fun a fun irony by keeping their culture alive they have to believe in ghosts well, that's a huge part of the underlying uh, context for the the mother daughter relationship right it's the mother still she grew up in that in that uh, culture and then left it with her daughter I don't remember what happened to the husband if he came he, with them he and died I think after the parents after both watch over. her get raped on the boat yeah they both lived through that experience but he came over to America right yeah, yeah. and I think he dies of like cancer or something it's it's at the very oh beginning. yeah that's right that's right I remember this but then like a lot of uh, um, immigrant families the uh, the next generation is grows up in America with right. American culture and um, it's there. there's that tension between um, the old culture and the new culture. You know, there's a lot of, uh, it's fertile. There's a lot of room right. there for great storytelling. Well, there's that moment where the mother is kind of chiding the daughter about what are you going to do at my funeral? She's like, a handful of people are going to come. If we were still in Vietnam, there'd be a couple hundred. And what are you going to say? And the daughter says, why don't you tell me what to say? I'll write it down. <laughs> That's right. Write it down. I'll read it. So... To Rob's point, this is like a story about parents trying to get a better life for their kids, right? So they come to America... And at what cost? Yeah, she's on her hands and knees, the narrator's mother. I mean, literally trying to scrounge after like the remnants of their culture. I mean, the remnants Mm -hmm. of their son. It was really moving and strange and sad and cool. Yeah, maybe it felt quiet too because this all, for the most part, takes place in their house, right? It's just the two of them and they don't really know each other. Yeah. (laughs) Well, that felt sad to me too. Like, I don't have a basement here in Florida anymore, but I grew up with a basement. Basements are definitely where ghosts hang out. And when you're a writer and you're going to write it, night and it's dark and cold and lonely i mean what a perfect setting yeah it just felt like a house full of people that were living together because they're related and not much else at that point point. and the americans are kind of so remote and in the periphery too when the, the little kids are um the bombs are being dropped you, you would think it's napalm and they're hiding in the bunker their dad made and i don't think any americans appear in the story either so it, which is kind of nice where it's just like no this is there as americans we're still we're so used to the vietnam stories being about us and then we kind of see them on the periphery or as antagonists or whatever so it was cool to um this is a, an angle i haven't seen as far as this time and place before mm-hmm. obviously i do like um she was we described the act of writing and she's a ghost writer and she, in the middle of um confronting this ghost she says writing was entering into fog feeling my way for a route from this world to the unearthly world of words a route easier to find on some days than others and when i read that it felt to me that it was like kind of reflective of an afterlife like you're digging around in an afterlife or a ghost Ghost world, unearthly world of words. It's kind of in that moment because it happens in the middle. It's kind of a uh, foreshadowing of the ending that she's going to find her sto- find stories and ghosts. But um, I just I just like that as a uh, description that was um, tied to the story so tightly. Right. I think that's one of those layers that maybe this author naturally wrote it that way the first time, or maybe this author edited that description in a way that really fit yeah. the the whole theme. And discovered it. Yeah, I discovered it. Yeah. Exactly. Sometimes we dance around the fringes of these things on our own and then realize after the fact and you just pretend you knew all along. That's right. But I think that's one of those layers that makes a story like this that much richer. Because like you said, the whole sort of side story of her being a ghostwriter, aside from the pun, feels like this extension of her life, right? She doesn't even write her own stories. She writes other people's stories. Yeah. You can almost imagine the author kind of, even before starting out with the story, just looking at the word ghostwriter and be like, there's so much here that Mm -hmm. I can do with. And maybe, like John was saying, maybe ghostwriting or to kind of, as a side point, maybe, I mean, all writing could be conceived as ghostwriting. Who are you really representing? Um, there's kind of a phrase that I like, every love story is a ghost story. I think you're always, you're always kind of, ch- you're, you're definitely chasing shadows, it seems like, when you're writing because this stuff is not real. So it's just, it's one more dimension to think about 
when you as a writer, you're writing, like you can go anywhere and kind of have the freedom of a ghost too, which kind of comes with its own sadness because the things that you're chasing, they're not going to talk back to you. And if they do, it's just yourself. And so of course, when she's talking to her brother, it's kind of like this question and answer game where she already knows the answers. It's kind of like if you're just talking to a mirror. I feel like this this story is like a catharsis for the writer. It's finding a thing that she can write about for herself, which turns out to be uh, other people's stories in the end too. But at least it's, it's she feels more connected to them because it's that connection with her mother. But um, her mom, after the ghost leaves for the last time, her mom tells her, you know, he's gone for good, don't you? He came and said all he wanted to say. And she replies, Ma, I said, I haven't said all I wanted to say, which is kind of, to me, feels like the crux of the ending of where we're arriving is um, because a paragraph later, she says, tell me a story, Ma. I'm listening. And then she found one easily. Yeah, that was a great little story she told her. Oh, yeah. That was, yeah. Yeah, all those stories are short stories in and of themselves. Yeah. And that story being, what is it? The um, the wife gets remarried after she thinks her husband's dead and they reunite oh, yes. and there's a picture and they both look like ghosts sort of yeah. and they don't know how to look at each other. He's been in POW camp He's been in camp, yeah. yeah. She's like, oops, sorry, I got remarried. <laughs> you look great though. Were you going to say something else about what you were describing there at the end? I was going to just tie back to what Rob said about as writers uh, and how we write. It's not always about us. It's like, who are we ghostwriting for? But I think this story feels like a story about writers, right? It's mm-hmm. like a very writerly, st- like not writerly in the, like a writer showing off, but writerly as in it speaks to writers. It's about writing. It's uh, among other things, obviously, but uh, it's very much embedded in the act of writing. Right. I want to read this section just because I like it, but there's a point where she has a flashback remembering a recent night when she called Victor the the latest subject of her ghost story and um, she says when I asked him if he had ever seen any ghosts he said all the time when I closed my eyes my wife and children appeared just like when they were alive with my eyes open I'll see them in my peripheral vision they move fast and disappear before I can focus on them. But I smell them too. My wife's perfume when she walks by, the shampoo in my daughter's hair, the sweat in my son's jerseys, and I can feel them. My son brushing his hand on mine, my wife breathing on my neck the way she used to do in bed, my daughter clinging to my knees, and last of all, you hear ghosts. My wife tells me to check for my keys before I leave the house. My daughter reminds me not to burn the toast. My son asks me to rake the leaves so he can jump in them. They all sing happy birthday to me. Oh, there is so much packed in there. And Victor does not need a ghostwriter if that's how he's describing these things, right? right. I mean, this is obviously our author, but that was just another example I thought of, like this other little story that I'll remember from this piece. Yeah, he's talking about kind of figurative ghosts, right? Maybe literal. Yeah. But, um, and then uh, she asks, aren't you in that passage, like a moment later, this is leading right up to her her major catharsis that ends the story or begins the ending of the story is, um, aren't you afraid of ghosts? She asks him, and um, eventually he says, you aren't afraid of the things you believe in. And he, she wrote that into the memoir, and she didn't understand it. And now that her, her brother's ghost is gone, she says, now I did, uh, meaning now I understood it. My body clenched as I sobbed without shame and without fear. My brother watched me curiously as I wept for him and for me, for all the years we could have had together but didn't, for all the words never spoken between my mother, my father, and me. Most of all, I cried for those other girls who had vanished and never come back, including myself. And this is the moment she's finally um it, it takes victor's what input, you read yeah. his input to make her to kind of like marry that moment with her brother to uh to this cathartic ending where she finally confront like feels the weight of all that and it is reconnected with it that's one of those lines too where i'm like did you come up with that on the spot the, the part about you you can't be afraid of what you believe in or did you hear it did someone say that i mean that's just one of those things that's like too perfect <laughs> it feels like it set off everything before and after it because like you said that's a climactic line yeah and it's dialogue i love the ending of this story and that catharsis like i said kind of sets up the ending but as i was rereading it when i was trying to like be more analytical about it and think what am i gonna learn from this story there were so many points where i was like it could end here and then it doesn't and it could end here and then it doesn't it seemed like it was about to end every page for the last three pages yeah (laughs) rob's like i don't mean mean a bad way it's not in a bad way every every one of those is a great moment i think i feel like the last paragraph could be lopped off without much yeah feels like the author kind of like summing like things bow. up yeah. yeah but um there's a lot of great little um just moments that occur right in that ending all in a spree 
So what would you guys take away from this one? Uh, I would kind of second guess my conventions as a like a, a Western person because obviously we, we write whether I think we generally write in genres um, they may be more loosely defined than some, some other ones but just to kind of think about not necessarily do I have to play with conventions but just sort of like look at them if I'm writing a story with that has an action scene well what does this action scene look like and what can I do with it to sort of upend it or just kind of come at it from a different angle because if, if I'm going to approach ghosts with total fear then and why couldn't I do it the other way? Why couldn't I do it with sadness or sympathy or whatever? And I think when you start doing that, when you start looking at conventions, then you can kind of start separating yourself from them a little bit. I like that. What about you, John? My uh, my answer is more conventional. <laughs> but uh, Details. <laughs> no, no. Um, <sighs> it's kind of related to what I had as, as my um, lesson from uh, The Balloon, like our, what, second episode? Yeah. This is slightly different in that I feel like the ghost, you can think of the ghost as being a metaphor, like the ghosts of your past can be metaphorical ghosts, but to have them actually walk out on stage. Right. And you can do this with all kinds of different metaphors. Like um, the one that came to mind when I was thinking about this was like the ghost is a metaphor for your past, whereas like a tour guide could be a metaphor for looking for the future, mm-hmm. right? Or something like that. And this, you do that the happens in fiction a lot. Um, and there's, I'm sure we could find other ghost stories where a ghost appears and kind of forces a character to confront their past because it's might be tropish in that way i can't think of an example but um oh, what's the christmas oh, one Cr- scrooge yeah <laughs> actually there's a line in here where where it's almost it's almost um scrooge reminiscent of scrooge where she says uh perhaps he was not a figment of my imagination but a symptom of something wrong like the cancer that killed You're just my a father. potato yeah exactly it's <laughs> piece of cheese undigested piece of beef but yeah, making have, using using the uh, the metaphor in a concrete like making the metaphor come to life for the balloon and for the metamor the Kafka's metamorphosis. It's a little more esoteric than a straight like what does the balloon represent? We spend the whole thing not really knowing. But here you can kind of guess what a ghost means right away, right? And mm-hmm. it, it just it just but it, it all the layers play out exactly right. It's um really well done and they all line up like everything hits the right like there's no loose ends in what the ghost represents. So if you're going to take a conventional metaphor, what you're saying is keep going. Like don't keep, stop, yes. just like follow it through as far as you can. Because at that point, it won't be conventional anymore. It'll become your own thing. Yes, it'll be, it'll grow into to what this has become where it's, it's very personal, mm-hmm. especially because it's all wrapped up in, in the, the culture and, right. um, and even the conflict of cultures. Because when the ghost comes originally, she's afraid of it. She's afraid of her brother's ghost as anyone would probably be afraid of a ghost. But, uh, where does the ghost, where does the, f- fear come from she she actually acknowledges it she says come in i said which seemed to me the bravest thing i could say because she was afraid of this ghost and then um a couple lines later she says what does one say to a ghost except to ask why he was here I was afraid of the answer. She already knows that this ghost is going to force her to confront things she doesn't, she's afraid to confront. And that's where her fear is coming from. So things like, not merely the ghost representing her brother, but the ghost confronting her with things that she's afraid to acknowledge in herself. All those little threads of the metaphor kind of find anchors within the story. I wonder if that's why the story feels writerly. I wonder if that was what the author was doing, like exploring this metaphor to its to its end and in doing that it kind of has to f- double back on itself and exp- it feels exploratory. I think that's my lesson is like you mm-hmm. do that just yeah. push it all the way and find find where it goes because where it goes is going to be you. I, I'm going to copy what I said in our YouTube exclusive episode which you'll have to go to YouTube to listen to where we talked about a little micro fiction piece. And my my takeaway from that was how each of those sentences felt like a story in and of itself. Like Rob said, they all built and they, all the details were super exciting and interesting. And this story, I felt like for as much as it explored those metaphors that John's talking about, and for as thorough as it was, there were also these little tangents where they were full-blown stories in and of themselves. The mom has soap operas that she's watching. She tells her daughter four or five stories throughout out. There's the bit with Victor that I read that I really liked. These are all these kind of pieces that could stand alone or be developed and that added so much. Each of those was so exciting to read. So sometimes I'll um, keep like a running Google Doc of stories that I don't think are full-blown stories, but I think that's like a cool little idea. And sometimes if I'm really bored, I'll try to force myself to like combine two of them. Oh, that's a good idea. 
Yeah. That's a great prompt. Sometimes it works and sometimes it's really stupid. And sometimes it's just nice to read that doc and, and say, wow, I'm pretty brilliant. There's a couple <laughs> of half-assed ideas here. I want to mention um, just uh, an adverb in this story. And uh, uh, <laughs> just uh, Stephen King is always quoted as saying uh, the, the road to hell is paved with adverbs or something like that. And then it's never quoted as later on in his book where he says, I decided to keep that adverb. <laughs> <laughs> and I prefer John Gardner's quote is something like, uh, adverbs are, are either the sharpest or the dullest tool in the writer's toolkit. And in this, st- I wanted to bring this up in this story, the, uh, oh, what was that story called? Um, the one about the, the woman in the, in the driver of the little shuttle bus. Oh, that was Ross. Gender studies. Oh, um, that was yours. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to bring it up in that story, gender studies, because there's a line in there where, where it was, uh, he was assiduously licking her left nipple and then he moved. <laughs> oh and then- my God. And then he moved to a right. And that word assiduously is, 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 is I love that word there. It, it works so well. <laughs> and then in this story, she writes, uh, my mother and I live together politely. And I, I love that, that line, that word there too. And this is one of those moments when the adverb can be the sharpest word for the sentence. And, uh, and so those are just examples of don't listen all the time to the advice of getting rid of adverbs. If the <laughs> adverb works, it works and it can be beautiful. Mm-hmm. Awesome. All right. Thanks, guys. Please include (laughs) the rapper. Rob is clearly scarred. (laughs)